welcome to power charting my friends my wyckoffian friends this is our last get together of 2023 in a very fond farewell to 2023 which has been a an exceptionally interesting and good year in the markets here comes 24. We are going to have a lot to say about 2024 in the uh, new year. Uh, today, what I'd like to do is just reveal a little bit about what I think is coming. Talk about bonds, which are making a statement right now. And with the idea that being our year-end episode, we want this to be a year-end cliffhanger. But it reminds me of um, the old series Dallas in the episode Who Shot JR. We want to leave you with a cliffhanger at the end of the season. And uh, let's see if we can't kind of do that here and uh, uh, interest you in coming back in 2024. With that, uh, let's get started. And if you just can't get enough of this great Wyckoff material, I heartily encourage you to come check out the Wyckoff Market Discussions, which Ramon and I do every Wednesday afternoon. They're recorded. You uh, can watch a recent uh, episode here at Wyckoff Analytics. Also, check it out for all this other great content that's available at Wyckoff Analytics. And so many exciting new things are going to be happening there in 2024. And uh, so also, uh, I will be announcing in the near future that there's going to be uh, a free WMD episode that's going to be available, and I will announce it ahead of time. So that'll be sometime early in the year. And with that, let us get started. You've seen this chart many times before. This is the S&P 500, and uh, this is the stride of the advance, which we saw that the ultimate low occurred here end of the quarter and this is really the key point i want to make with this chart i'm not going to uh, go through it as i have in the past is just that the quarter and year ends are exceptionally important and you'll note that important highs and lows happen they nest around the ends of quarters ends of years etc and so uh this we can see the market here is driving up into the end of the quarter, end of the year. That's exactly what happened in 2021, which uh, came at the end of the bull market. Not saying it's the end of the bull market here. Uh, let's uh, look for additional uh, evidence, but the trend is distinctly up. Now, part of it is, and the reason I want to make this big point here is the fact, and this came three weeks into the new quarter, and then uh, we, we've looked at some seasonality that showed the end of the year was going to be uh, seasonally strong. And in fact, that's exactly what's happened. Now, here, we're pushing up not only into the um, end of the year, we're pushing up into the bull market highs of 2021 should be some resistance there does not mean that the market has to go down it may slow the advance of the market or even cause it to have to spend time building cause to move ahead uh, and we will uh, watch that closely in the new year the uh so that is a very big point i want to make the other point i want to make is is that the institutions are what drive these effects and the institutions were uh, literally throwing over uh, the underperforming mega cap growth type names into the end of the bear market in 2022. And that was right into this period. And go check out, I've showed you this in other charts, not today, the NDX, for instance, almost got down to its lows uh, from October and then start as it, its advance. And look at this comparison that these institutions are gonna to have to deal with when they make performance reports to their clients, is they're gonna to have to take from this low here up to wherever the high is 
at the end of the year. And I expect that there's going to be additional strength into the early part of January. And so uh, uh, definitely this upward stride, very good year for performance, very difficult year for the institutions because they sold down their mega cap holdings in many cases under window dressing at the end of 22. And now there appears to be some window dressing taking place at the end of 23, which is to buy additional shares. Now I'm gonna make the case today that we are into rotation and this rotation is an, a wonderful opportunity for stock market uh, traders, investors uh, such as us and that if we can identify these themes that we can benefit handsomely. I said in a prior episode that the uh, CO, composite operator types, which are a very special class of institutions, very smart, very anticipatory, very good at what they do, that they, have, they know that these institutions are gonna have to sell down in 2024 their mega cap exposure because these stocks are up on average almost 50% on the year. And so they're gonna have to just sell down their exposure to get to a more normal allocation. And they're gonna wanna wait till they get into the new year so they can show these stocks in their portfolios. And they're not gonna sell out these stocks. They're gonna continue to hold them in large uh, position sizes. They're just going to have to reduce, it's inevitable. And this market carpet from Monday, very cool feature, upgraded recently by stock charts, great stuff. You can see the very big blocks in this chart, which and these are the S&P 500 type stocks, but the big blocks are the uh, Magnificent Seven type names. And look at the red in those uh, categories in those stocks and look at the green. This to me is the evidence of rotation. Rotation is occurring and it is the CO types selling early because they don't have the competition of other institutions stepping in and raising cash away from their mega cap portfolios and uh, so they don't have a lot of competition and they are selling in many cases to the window dressers. Now, the other institutions will follow along and do the same thing as we go into the new year. But already this migration of funds, you can see it in the market carpet. Look at the green and look where it is by sector, by industry group, you can see that the green is the smaller companies that have dividend. They have value uh, characteristics that are attractive. They're much less expensive on a valuation basis than the Magnificent Seven and the other growth stocks. And so you can see here that uh, these stocks are enjoying migration of funds. And this, I believe, can continue. More on that in a minute. Okay, and so here we can see a relative strength study using point and figure, one of my favorite things to do. Two uh, indexes of growth stocks are the triple Qs, NASDAQ 100, and then the uh, MGK, which is the mega cap growth Vanguard index and uh, ETF. And uh, they both are very similar, so they're not gonna look much different. You notice here, that they have stopped outperforming the Russell. When that line flattens out, when it's going down, the triple Qs and the MGK are outperforming the Russell. The Russell has been a laggard all year. Now, note very quietly, not getting a lot of attention a little bit, is that since October, the Russell 2000 small cap value-oriented index is starting to perform on parity with these Magnificent Seven dominant growth ETFs. And so you see that a flat line, that is a causal structure. Now in both cases, these are unfinished. They may not, they may not reverse and go up. 
it's too early to tell. We do have here a sign of strength uh, of the uh, Russell against the triple Qs, but it's pulled back in. It continues to be in the trading range. We need to see an ascent from the this relative strength relationship. If we get it, these counts, which could grow larger, uh, or if you know, it could be that the Russell just continues to underperform. But there's a lot of good companies that are smaller. They're undervalued in this uh, Russell index that may attract the attention of institutions as they rotate funds, uh, which inevitably we think they have to do. And we note that if we can get out of here, wherever that might happen, this count could grow bigger. Now, this is just a ratio relationship. So those numbers only mean something in the context of where they are now, which is around 46 and a half. But getting to 57 uh, would be a uh, real, real evidence of a new outperforming trend by the Russell against the uh, growth stocks, which has not happened for a long, long time. Same thing with the uh, mega cap uh, here. And so we'll just keep watching that and see because both these are saying, telling us the story that if this is a, an accumulation structure, they can jump out and go. So we'll keep an eye on that. Now, here is the MGK. It's just a point and figure case study analysis on the left, we have intraday. On the right, we have end of day uh, daily uh, analysis, one box reversal method. Now, we saw these uh, before. I want to point out that the MGK has, in fact, gone up a little bit more since we last met. I wanted to put the price up there because you'll note that on the intraday 15 minute top left here, that this count across here counts up to. 256. We touched 255.94 today, probably in the 256 area now, because there was a very good uh, outcome from the Fed meeting and their decision for rates, which are unchanged, but uh, definitely a softening of their language, which was bullish for the market. So I believe we could be uh, in the 256 plus area now. And in here, you can see that on the daily basis, this is a beautiful structure going back to uh, uh, October and then uh, October to this pullback here in March. So that's October of 22. And you can see this counts 250 to 266. And again, same comment, we're up in the 256, 257 area. So we are striking the mid zone of this count structure we will watch for the evidence of stopping action. This does look a lot like a buying climax type event. And we will have to confirm that with an automatic reaction of largely equal proportion in reverse to demonstrate in fact that that's what this is. And until we get that, we continue to focus on the upward direction of these indexes. Okay, with that, let's move on. Ah, here's another reveal for you. And this is, look at the Dow Jones compared to the, to the NASDAQ 100, which is the basis for the triple Qs. And also, these are the stocks that are in the MGK. But we're looking at two indexes. It's a relative strength chart. And you can see that since June, that's what this number, this number six is, really since June, the Dow Industrials has been performing on parity with the mega cap Magnificent 7 NASDAQ 100. And you can see that there is an attempt to go sideways. And the stride, you can see an oversold condition here where we took out the bottom of this declining trend channel. Now, keep in mind, this is a relative strength chart. This is not a price chart. This is a relationship between these two indexes. So we look for directionality. Down says that the NDX outperforms. Up would say that the Dow would perform. Now, the Dow hasn't been outperforming for a while now. And you can see that if we can get up and out of this downward striding channel, that could be 
uh, a positive, we see that there's a retest of the low here to here. 27 columns counts up to 272. And so we will watch this count may grow bigger. It may, in fact, just be a consolidation before another decline where the Dow uh, continues to underperform until we resolve by breaking out one way or the other. We're only uh, making guesses or estimates about what could happen. So far, this is the amount of cause that we have developed here. And you can see that if we start to stride up and out of this area, that it could very well be that the Dow Industrials is a surrogate for the blue chip stocks. Those are the smaller blocks in our heat map. And so the uh, big blocks, the big red ones on Monday are flowing into the smaller ones where the value is and the Dow is representative of that uh, phenomenon. And this relative strength chart is a visualization of what we just talked about. So I think that's very cool. And I love doing point and figure on relative strength. We just will keep an eye on this uh, in the new year. And I know you're going to miss me into the end of the year, but there's really not going to be a whole lot going on. But anyway, uh, I'll miss you. I know that. So anyway, here we go. So here's the S&P. Now, this chart uh, is pretty much the same or similar to the one that uh, we had talked about prior. Uh, it doesn't have the quarter end effect on it. The thing I want to focus on is breadth, which is the bottom panel. And the bottom panel is stocks on the New York above their 50-day moving average. This is a breadth indicator. We look at it often. What we look for is we look for overbought, oversold. We look for uh, directionality and we at divergence, and we look for directionality. And right now we have, as we saw here, this place right here, that was divergence. You saw the divergence. It came in in July. We talked about it at the time. It was a great indication, overbought, diverging, and then we look for confirmation with a downward stride. We got that in July to October, down, 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 three waves down. So here we had a lower low. Here we had a non-confirmation of the lower low by the breadth indicator stocks above their 50 did not go down to new lows with the index. That is a, a positive indication. We confirm that with a reversal of trend. This came uh, with a mighty reversal. Recall also that we had excellent um, uh, indications of seasonality coming in and it almost struck exactly to the day of when the seasonality started to go positive in late October. And that was uh, very impressive. Now we have worked our way all the way up to overbought and we have the very earliest signs of divergence. And uh, they could grow larger. Divergences at tops can go on for a longer period of time. And so we have to keep that in mind. But here, uh, this puts us on notice that as we push up into overbought, into resistance, into the end of the year, that there are headwinds. And we want to keep those in mind. And we've had a great run since October. And so uh, let's just uh, keep that in mind and when we consider our strategy and tactics and risk management. Another breadth indicator, this is a series of them. We talk about these uh, every so often. And here you see the New York composite, which is this panel right here, is pushing higher and higher uh, into the resistance of the July high. Note that we have a downward striding uh, over uh, advanced decline 10-day moving average. That is a breadth indicator of a different type than what we just looked at. And we look again for overbought, divergence, and then directionality. We don't have downward directionality. We can have divergences last for a long time. This was a relatively long one. It was almost a month. They can be even longer than that. And here we can see that we're about two plus weeks into divergence here. And there's an attempt to push up by the New York composite, making higher highs, which is not yet confirmed by the advanced decline. 
10 day oscillator. So something for us to keep in mind. The up volume continues to make new highs here. That's a positive, but also note that the down volume on a 10 day basis is also striding up, but that can go on for a while. And so what we look for is when we get convergence, like here, you can see that there's convergence and here you can see convergence. And uh, so those are the things that will tell us that um, there's more active selling. We don't see selling now, don't expect to see it into the end of the year because of the effects of window dressing. We expect to see more buying forces. Okay, now here is the net advanced decline volume. Note it also is making lower highs, attempting to go down, but does not have active directionality in the southward direction. And so we'll just keep an eye on that. And then finally, the new high list, this is bullish. New high list keeps making new highs. Normally when the new high list is making new highs, the indexes will continue up beyond that and divergences will form as the market is pushing higher. Generally, there's exceptions to every rule. So we will watch that also. Now here's the NASDAQ, NASDAQ composite, very important, pushing up, up above the July highs. It's uh, slightly above now. Good news from the Fed today. So there may be uh, continued strength for the next few days. But also note that, and remember, we talked about how in the NASDAQ, the growth stocks were likely to be sold into the end of the year by the CO types. And you can see here that the volume of the down volume in red here is actually above the up volume in blue. And so we have a, a active selling pressure in volume in the NASDAQ as the index is pushing up. That is a form of divergence. And also note that we have divergent characteristics in the 10-day advanced decline oscillator. Now, we don't have directionality in the southward direction, so we just watch that. It may resolve itself. But for now, we're uh, just keeping a close eye on that day to day. Now, uh, down here, you see this is net volume in this area here. Net volume is in a southward direction, reflecting the fact that down volume is expanding. And the down volume being above the up volume puts this up below zero. So that is showing selling pressure into the end of the year in these very high priced overvalued stocks. So again, something for us to really keep on the forefront of our thinking. Now, here's our big reveal for uh, the end of the year into 2024. And let's start with just a review of interest rates, two years on the left, five year on the right. And what I'm gonna do here is I'm showing you an update through a few days ago. The point figures haven't changed much. You'll note that we got into our objective range here and tested it reversed. And we've gone down and uh, reflected the fact that this accumulation structure has been fulfilled resulted in a sharp decline in yields for the two year uh, US treasuries. And so uh, I suspect that we are in a range bound situation about in this area and we're liable to spend time in here. Uh, the good news from the Fed may very well put in a good, uh, um, a good news top for bond prices, which is the inverse of this data. So, uh, but time, we will watch the next few days to see if that happens. Now, let's go over here, ignore this data uh, here. But here is what's happened in the five year. And you can see this count I showed you. The chart on the left is from August. Chart on the right is from July. We've talked about them since that time. I just keep updating them. You can see that count structure there counted up to that uh, 476 area. Well, in fact, Look what's happened. We went up through over the top of it and then reversed very hard, which often happens at the end of a move. And so we see that big throw over, a big reversal. Down we go. Uh, I believe that we are probably range bound roughly in this area. And 
I decided that we needed to expand this count uh, and take it out further because it makes sense. I tend to be conservative and then I'll add count later, but note that that count takes us up 462 to 504. We went right up to 490, we're right into the midpoint of that count range and reversed off of that. So we have fulfilled the accumulation base count in that re accumulation structure of higher interest rates. And so I think that interest rates are effectively done going up for uh, the foreseeable future. And that I think was confirmed by the Fed today. Now, this is uh, part of the reveal though. Look at 10 year yields. So here, this is a count that goes back to August. And this count of that big structure actually reaches back into 2022. And so a very big accumulation structure for rates, meaning that higher rates were the result of that. We talked about these counts at the time and it counted up to 480 to 520. And let's look at what we got. And we went right up to 490, reversed very, diff very hard back now down to where old resistance new support is. And so I wouldn't be surprised if somewhere in here, we don't find a uh, low for yields and yields just mark time as uh, we go into the new year and beyond. So about time will tell, maybe they just reverse really sharply. But let me uh, bring this even more up to date. Let me clear this chart up a little bit. We're almost done. And that is, uh, this is just more data. Uh, this is a, a smaller scaling size using TNX, dollar sign TNX for the 10 year yield. And uh, you can see that we had beautiful counts off this structure. This is basically the count that we uh, looked at or part of the count that we looked at on the prior slide, prior chart. But I wanted to show you this distribution count. This is for yields. And you can see that we are down into the area here of the uh, lows around uh, 4.05. And so that is part of the reason that I think we may be looking at this being, at least for the moment, a low and that we get some kind of a trading range in TNX in the five-year yields, 10-year yields in this case. And then uh, here's the uh, uh, seven to 10-year U.S. Treasury ETF. Uh, as a surrogate, you've seen this chart before. I put this up back in November. And then I'm bringing this up to date through yesterday. This is December 12th. You can see how much it's run. But the question I ask is, well, now uh, what I see here is a potential swing trading count. And I want to check that on a point and figure basis. So let's, in fact, do that. You can see that our distribution count did a beautiful job of giving us a target down to 88. We went to 89. Pretty nice. Now, let's update this chart with point and figure. And you can see that there is a swing trading accumulation structure. Well, how high can that go? And uh, we see that uh, this, in fact, takes us 95 to 97 and a half on the 7 to 10 year Treasury bond. Now, we're looking at prices here, not yields. So we, we're looking at prices going up. We're only one box from hitting our minimum objective. We could go all the way to 97 and a half, which is an important resistance zone. And so we might uh, be able to work our way up to that level. But uh, we're getting close. And like I said, this is just a period where we could uh, spend time and even rates could go lower and prices could go higher after that. And so that's uh, kind of the look. But here is what I think is really revealing about what's going on. I have taken the SPY, which is the ETF of the S&P 500, and I have done a relative strength point and figure comparative of the SPY to the 20 plus year US Treasury ETF. These are prices. This is relative strength of prices. And I have gone back, I, I, you can see here prior counts that I've done, they've worked out very nicely. These prior counts, I won't get into them now. But what I want to do is I want to emphasize that we have a count objective of 500 to 524. 
up here and we went right to 525, hit it perfectly at the high end. And look at the distribution structure that formed. This is a classic structure with an upthrust that came right here and uh, then a, a downward push, very sharp downward push showing that that was an upthrust after distribution because of the veracity of the drop back through support. Then a rally up to complete the structure and now we're heading down again. What are the implications for this? Are we seeing rotation away from risk? And when I talk about risk, I'm really talking about the Magnificent Seven type stocks. Also, uh, stocks are expensive. Now, the blue chip stocks are very much less overpriced than are the Magnificent Seven, but it could be that there's a general flow away, a rotation away from those stocks, and that could be a burden on the indexes for some period of time. And notice this distribution count takes us all the way down on a relative strength ratio basis down to 405 to 390. The downward direction of stride here just tells us that bonds have the potential to outperform stocks. That's pretty amazing. So could it be that bonds become the really stellar performers in the first part of 2024? I ask that as a year-end cliffhanger of a question so that we can talk about it next year. And now, uh, bonds ha now have yield. So they have, the, even now, with the amount of yield that has been removed, I mean, the yields have dropped in the bonds. They still have a significant amount of yield. And we see uh, PPI down at zero as of today, month over month, obviously. And then we also see CPI is trying to moderate also. It's just a little above 3% now. And so uh, we, there is real yield potentially from uh, treasuries and other types of bonds now. So there is some value in the bond market. So bonds have yield. So could bonds outperform stocks for some number of months in 2024? A very important question. Another way to look at this here is the uh, NASDAQ 100 triple Q ETF and the chart on the left is now this is through the not through the eighth, but the chart on the left is a uh, has a distribution structure and note since the beginning of October, the end of the quarter that the TLT started to perform on parity equal to the performance of the triple Qs. That's pretty impressive. And so uh, the eat with all of the, the hubbub about, uh, you know, the Magnificent Seven, how well they're performing going up into the end of the year, the bond market has kept pace. Pretty interesting. And this is just price. This doesn't include yield. Point and figure chart on the right. Just showing you that if we continue to get a breakdown, now this chart is up to date through today. If we get a breakdown, it's up into resistance now. You can see that right here. We could have uh, outperformance if we can get this turning down again uh, from this level. Could be a, uh, a period of outperformance by bonds over magnificent seven type stocks. Pretty impressive. And with that, my dear white coffee and friends, I thank you so much for hanging out with me in 2023. I've had a blast. I hope that's the case for you. I really enjoy talking about these markets. And uh, and really, in my heart, I think of myself talking directly to you about these markets and uh, hoping that uh, these reveals, these charts uh, are speaking to you and helping you. A very, very happy holiday season to you and yours. Uh, I look forward to seeing you in 2024. And uh, just to conclude, I want to point out the beautiful wreath. The wreath is a, actually a very ancient symbol. And the wreaths are made out of evergreens. So that symbolizes the evergreen nature of the uh, uh, of us of our world in the in the circle 
reflects the cycles, the cycles of life, the cycles of the economic conditions, uh, the uh, agricultural cycles, all of that and the recognition of cycles is in the circular uh, wreath form and uh, that it just goes on and on and on. And our job here is to just be in tune, understand that cyclical nature, to act in concert with it, not to fight it. And, uh, uh, and I think that the wreath is a wonderful way to do that. And it's put up at the end of the year because it is the end of the old year, the beginning of the new. And uh, so let us enjoy our understanding and our pursuit of uh, our the cycles of our work, the cycles of our lives, and um, uh, and always be seeking for abundance in that. And with that, I'll say a wonderful goodbye for now, and we'll see you in the new year.